Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the only first listen new music review show hosted by a French professor who will mysteriously be discussing country music today. I've only discussed country music two or three times today, but I got a text from my oldest brother, and he said, you know, this is a great album, you should listen to it. Steve Earle, Ghosts of West Virginia. And it is a great album of Americana and folk and old time country, and, and I enjoy it very much. I think it's really good. It's not just because I love West Virginia. You see the football back there. My, my father used to work there. My brothers were born there. And my oldest brother has lived there for 25 years. That's not the reason why. The reason why is because I want to really use this as an opportunity to discuss a theme that's really fascinated me. And in order to do that, I'm going to counterpoint this folksy Americana, real good music, unimpeachably good music, guaranteed to win five Grammys music of Ghosts of West Virginia by Steve Earle, and compare it with Florida Georgia Line and their new EP, Six Pack. I'm comparing the absolute most authentic sounding, heartfelt country music you can have, Back to the Roots, with the most poppy, bro, hey let's have a beer, drive some trucks, pop country. I was listening to uh, all this music and, and over the weekend, my children who never listened to country music, my son heard Florida Georgia Line and he said, is this satire? They just keep singing about trucks and beer. I thought that was just a stereotype. I said, no, it's not just a stereotype, but how often do rap songs talk about diamonds and cars? I mean, there's not that much new stuff being said in most music. So that's the sort of setup I'm giving you here. Steve Earle and Florida Georgia Line. But in order to actually get to what I want to talk about, it's not really a music review. I am a professor, it's not just a cute thing I call myself, and I want to use this as an opportunity to discuss something much deeper. I want to discuss the concept of social realism in the time of pop. What was that? Was that the sound of people turning off a crazy pretentious title? I don't care, you're still here, so you're gonna listen to me talk about social realism in the time of pop. I think there's something profound that's happened in popular culture, and I think that even the term popular culture itself needs to be redefined or at least reconsidered in the context of what the word originally meant. So I brought some visual aids. I studied art history and I want to talk to you about what exactly it is. What is realism? Because I would argue that this album by Steve Earle is a good example of social realism. He is trying to tell us the truth about people who are usually ignored. I want to show you a painting. This is from 1849. It's called The Stonebreakers by Gustave Courbet. And this represented an absolute revolution in art. I actually teach this work in one of my classes, French 352. Let me tell you why this was so revolutionary. You see, at the time that this painting was made, the dominant style was classicism. Something like this, you know, Madame Recamier by Gérard the grace, the beauty. It looks like Greek sculpture and Greek statue. This is the art of the nobility, the art of the aristocracy. And all of a sudden, we're getting art about stone breakers. What are these stone breakers doing? Do you know what they're doing? Why are they breaking stone? Because they're gonna build a road. Progress. Progress for the great capitalist project. You need roads, you need people to break the stones. These dark, gritty colors, these weather-beaten faces, which you can't really see, but they're in there. These people who are at the very lowest rungs of society. What realism taught the world was that these people are deserving of study, of representation, and even praise. That these people are heroes. Not so much this. Okay, she's pretty, she's fancy, but this is the world. This is the world we actually live in. I want to show you another painting by, Cour uh, by Courbet in the same style. It's called The After Dinner at Ornon. Look at these guys here. Look at the way he's depicting it. You know, I like to imagine that these are the very same uh, stone breakers that we saw in the previous painting. They've been working all day and they're tired and they just want to listen to some music in the bar and get drunk and forget their troubles. The classicism was replaced, or at least 
there was a countercurrent to classicism. And it's important to note that all art is political. I don't know why, it's really hard for my students to understand this, but I will often show this and ask them, why is this a political work? And they get stuck, they don't quite know. Because neoclassicism supports aristocracy, nobility, and monarchy, and because realism supports people, supports the idea that we need to take human beings who work seriously. Realism itself would become later known, slightly nuanced, as social realism. You notice the word social in there. Well, that's the nature of socialism. I have my students learn about the development of socialism in the 19th century first by studying this damn painting, because this culture explains the currents that were happening in our minds. But then we have a problem. Okay, so first of all, we're established here, right? Social, socialism, the belief that we need to lift up the bottom part of our society and that we need to create safety nets and protect each other. That's right, reinforced by socialism. But then there's this sort of problem, right? But let's go back in time in my, in my Miss Your Pain uh, time machine and talk to these people and say, hey, hey boys, we're going to the museum. We're going to the gallery. We're gonna show you some art. What, what do they wanna see? Do they wanna see this? Do they wanna see themselves suffering, dying for some rich man to get 10 more dollars for a road that he's making? Or maybe they wanna see the pretty lady, the fantasy, the ideal woman, the ideal life. This is the problem, that social realism is often made by those in the ruling class. It's a way to think about the way the world works. But is it really for them? They are the subject of what is being written, of what is being painted, but are they the audience? Now this is the issue. This is not a problem. These guys, these guys, they were not going to any museums. In the 1900s, there were no, there was no popular culture. There was no mass culture. Technology would have to create the radio and the television and advancements in print and eventually the computer and all that in order for popular culture to exist. So the reason that I'm focusing on Steve Earle, this great work of social realism, and comparing it with Florida Georgia Line, this great work of pop, is that Steve Earle is writing an album for the people of West Virginia, for the miners, for the working class, the working poor of West Virginia. He's giving them this. Florida Georgia Line is giving them that. It's worth remembering uh, that the word pop itself is about the people. In French, if you say populaire, only in the last 10 years has that word meant popular in the way that we mean it. It comes from the same word that people comes from, of pertaining to the working class. That is the definition of popular. And in English, when the word started to come into usage around 1750, that was the way that it was used, referring to the working class. Pop is for the working class. So what do we do with an album that comes in and says, this is the greatest, most important thing for the working people? And then we have over here, pop music, six pack, whole album about beer and trucks and about having a good time that doesn't question the status quo, that doesn't put any kind of political pressure on the system. But that's actually for the people. So that's the, that's the paradox I wanna get into today. Or I suppose I've already started getting into it. One of the main problems is, is that pop music and popular culture in general is co-opted very easily. So pop supports the dominant social structures and the ruling class. That's just how it works. That's how it works in hip hop, in rock. Think about the way that popular culture is. It's all supporting consumerism. It's supporting corporatism, class division, conservative politics, blind nationalism. Pop works to pacify the people. Whereas social realism works to try to show people this is what you are. This is what's happening to you. So I'm studying both. 
I'm going to focus on Steve Earle because it's much more listenable. Uh, the Dr. and Mrs. Payne would not listen to Florida Georgia Line. That was a bridge too far. But she came to like the Steve Earle album, which I guess is a sort of another problem of a Yankee like me studying country music, is at times I can come across as patronizing. I'm not. I just don't know that much about country music. I just don't know much about it, even though my brother lives in West Virginia. So what is the album about, the, the, the ghosts of West Virginia? Well, it's about miners. It's about the history of miners. It's about the decline of the working class. It's about the way the wealth gap grows. It's about the way our social safety nets have been taken away. One of the ghosts that's in this album, who's never mentioned, is the specter of Donald Trump. He is everywhere in this album. Everywhere. His name is never said once. I don't think him in particular is being targeted here as much as the politics that he represents. The, the hyper-individualistic, hyper-capitalistic system that he supports. Because this album is also very much about corporate greed. It is in part about the big branch mine disaster, which killed 29 miners all the way back in 1910. The company was found guilty, but, you know, people mostly forgot about it. Uh, the, the person who was found responsible, the person who owned the mine, just a year before, had been making speeches about how mine safety are, are killing miners and how it's killing the industry and how we have to reduce regulation. That same person was found guilty and only served a year of prison for essentially being responsible for the death of 29 people before running for Senate. Did, did I say 1910? No, you see, that was 2010. That was a, a 19th century... 20th century disaster that happened 10 years ago. When I listened to this album, I was like, oh, I sort of remember that. So this is very much taking that moment, that symbolic moment and that real moment and focusing on that. What was the life of those 29 people? A lot of this album is about the despair, not just the despair of the fact that people have forgotten and that the, those deaths were in vain and never really recom recompensed, but it's the despair, I believe, of feeling that the people who you come from, the people who you are trying to speak to and speak for, are being used as props. And that's the thing about, about these miners. Why are miners in the cultural conversation? Because Donald Trump understood that that hat, if he wore it, if he talked about miners, he could use them as a symbol for what he thinks America wants to think of itself. And the despair is that they're being used as props and it's effective. And the people in the country go, yeah, Trump likes miners, old time work, work for work and work for Americans. Ironically, <laughs> Steve Earle is using them as a prop in another way. <laughs> using the social realism, using them as a way to explain exactly that what was supposed to bring them up is actually pushing them down. That these people in, in the states and in the country who support Trump for what he represents, he's trying to show them the reality that they're not being lifted up but being pushed down by Trumpian politics. The people of West Virginia, the pop Ulysses. So this is the question, and I, I go back to it again. If we are imagining ourselves, let's imagine we're a survivor of the of Big Branch disaster, or whatever. We live in that town, and our family's been coal miners, and and you know, let's imagine that we're at the bar, and we're just we're just having a drink, and we're hanging out. What, what do we want to listen to? Do you want to listen to a Recrimination? Do we want to get mad? Or do we want to say it's ksh, beer 30? Because that's the opening track to Florida Georgia Lions six pack EP, beer 30. I'm gonna read you the lyrics right now. <clears throat> yeah, I'm talking about beer 30 and I am thirsty. And I've been working like a dog all week. So maybe Something cold won't hurt me. Cause it's beer 30 and it's time to party. Yeah, baby. Those are the lyrics. Yeah, baby. Austin Powers wrote these. Here it is. A song for those people. I've been working like a dog all week long. Something cold won't hurt me. 
Even though this album is a disgusting celebration of consumerism and class division, which I'll get to soon, in this song we get the sense of the desperation, something cold, whatever small amount of joy that can be gotten from life is the joy that they're taking from Beer 30. And in this way, I think it actually goes quite well with Steve Earle. The first track on Steve Earle's album, although it's not a, a part of the country machine, right? Florida Georgia Line has like five writers, five producers, five engineers, and they just churn out songs that sound like songs that get played on the radio, just churning it out in the great machine. Steve Earle opens up his album with a track, Heaven Ain't Going Nowhere which must be a spiritual or an imitation of a spiritual or a take on a spiritual. And the first lines, you hear his voice. He's an old man. He's like an old, I don't know anything about him, but he's like an old legend of, of country music. He's written for Johnny Cash and all that, you know? And you hear his voice, and his voice has got, his voice has a beard, you know what I mean? Like his voice has wisdom to it. River Jordan, huh? Okay, and you hear it. But what's he singing about? It's a spiritual about working too hard and knowing you're going to die. And he even says, I work all day, so I sleep all night. Raise a little hell on a Saturday night. I reckon heaven ain't going nowhere. So what does it mean? What, what, what time does that mean it is on Saturday night? It's beer 30. It's beer 30 all over the place. They're both describing the sad joys of the working poor in this society. Just one of them is saying, Yeehaw! Let's enjoy it! And the others have turned and the other has turned it into a desperate, sad tale of misery. Let's keep going with the uh, I'm not gonna talk that much about Florida George Line, by the way. I anyways, I'll get to him at the end. The next track uh, by Steve Earle is called Union God and Country. And this is fascinating because again, uh, the idea the stereotype of rural America is that it's all about God and country, you know? That God and country, God and country, God and country. By reminding us that what it used to be was union, God, and country, Steve Earle is making a very strong political statement. I had never really thought about that, but it makes sense. It wasn't so long ago that the working class in America was extremely attached to union and un uh, unions, syndicalism, one would even say forms of socialism. So what he does is, you know, the music's beautiful, you know, it's got like guitar work and fiddle, very traditional country, very easy to listen to for a Yankee like me who has a hard time with, with a lot of country music staples. It has this really profound message about the importance of unions. Actually, I think this would go pretty well I think if you listen to this album and then watch the movie Matawan by John Sayles, which is about a, a strike in a mine in West Virginia, I think you'd have like a good sort of two shot of like social realism in cinema and movies with West Virginia as a, as a, and that's my homework for you, as a matter of fact. I can't grade you, but if you did that, I think you'd find something interesting. Leave it in the comments if you do. Then comes my absolute highlight of the album, Devil Put the Coal in the Ground. It's got banjo, it's a great lead guitar. He does something uh, in, in this, in every, basically every track, where he really knows how to manipulate dynamism, how to create emotion and get feeling and like take, take tracks out. And by the end, like you just wanna just dance and stomp and it's an amazing sound, all basically led by this banjo. I'm gonna actually play you a little bit of it now. I'm just gonna play you uh, 14 seconds of Devil Put the coal in the ground, just so you get a sense of what it sounds like. And then after that, I'll talk more about the thematics of the song and, and how it fits into the music. Just enough to prevent there being ads on this video. And it's just great. Devil put the coal in the ground. And that's the sort of elephant in the room, the, the, the struggle of most social realism is that it's so connected to socialism and anti-capitalist. The idea that the coal in the ground that the miners are getting for is put there by the devil. The lines are, devil put a coal in the ground, 
said it'd be worth a dollar one day. Good Lord gave me two hands to dig. It's a beautiful image, a beautiful concept that the money, that one dollar, that that poor person at that table who had to work all day to get, the poor person listening to Florida Georgia Line, had to work so hard to get, was put there by the devil. And the devil is what keeps that capitalist machine going and what keeps these people's lives worth less than the coal that they are extracting. Brilliant. And then he follows it right up with John Henry was a steel driving man, a take on an old classic traditional track. Uh, my favorite version of that's by Woody Guthrie. But here, John Henry is completely deracialized. No, nothing, there's no talk about his mammy or anything like that, like there is in older versions. Uh, it's just about him as a worker. And what's great is that he manages to make it about industrialization and mechanization of work. So that by the end, like they, they talk about John Henry and then they talk about machines coming in. And I mean, of course, the John Henry story is always about industrialization, but they extend it out or he extends it out in the song and makes it so clear that uh, he's somehow able to make this old track feel new. And it's quite something. Uh, the next track, Time is uh, Never on Our Side. At first, I was like, why is this on here? This doesn't fit the theme. This isn't really about coal miners, but it is. It's about the dreary, unending misery of the working poor. And in particular, there's one line that I find interesting. Ours is not to question why. Now that's a, I think it's the Marines or the Navy. No, no, Marines or the Army have the slogan, ours is not to question why, ours is but to do and die. And I think that that's this war, you know, that these coal miners are soldiers in the war of coal. And they have to extract the coal so that that guy, that, that guy who ran for Senate and murdered those people, so that he can make a little extra money. Theirs is not to question why, theirs is but to do and die. And this is where things get interesting, because I would say that this is, in attacking capitalism, very much attacking America. It's attacking American values. It's making us very class conscious. And that's where Florida Georgia Line comes back in. Let's think about the complacency in a track that they released called I Love My Country, a ridiculously catchy song. I cannot stop singing this song. I love my country. I love my country. <laughs> Anyways, drink a beer out the can, liquor out the bottle, how the good Lord intended it. Yes, he did. I love my country, I love my country. Barbecue, steak, fry, styrofoam, plate, date, night. Ain't sorry, ain't nothing to be sorry about. I love my country, and I love my country up loud. If we unpack, Jesus, I sound like an academic. I'm just gonna go for it. If we unpack all of these words, what are they saying? Drink my beer out of a can. I eat my, my, my barbecue on a styrofoam plate. Now this is trying to say like he's real and he's down home and he, that's just who he is and he's of the people. He's popular, of the populace. But really what he's saying is ours is not to question why. All we can afford is a $10 30 pack and we're gonna drink it out the can and we're gonna kill our brain and we got nothing to apologize about. We're just going to eat barbecue on styrofoam plates because we can't afford better plates, because we can't afford better food culture, because we are just going to take all of this oppression, all of this injustice, internalize it, glorify it, and make sure that the machine keeps going. Make sure that the devil put the coal in the ground and you take the coal out and I'll make you a little song about how that beer that you bought tastes good. Because remember when the beer tasted good? That's because it was good tasting. Do you know why it's beer 30? Because ours is not to question why. It's a pretty good comparison, I think, because we don't need to demonize the people drinking the beer and having the styrofoam plates. That's not, it's not their fault, it's always beer 30. It's the system's fault. And that's the system that Steve Earle is comparing, is criticizing. And that's why my conclusion, which I was gonna to get to later, I'm, I'm not done yet, is that you need to listen to both of these to really understand the meaning of all of this music. What is this music that is being made for and about white, urban, I mean, white, rural, poor? 
It's an important topic, and it's all right here in both of these albums. So give yourself, it only takes 45 minutes to listen to both these things. Next track, it's all about blood. This is 100% about that 2010. Sorry if I pissed you off because you thought that I didn't know. I was trying to be funny. Not funny, but challenging. It sounds like he's, you know, like he's just going straight after the mine owners, straight after Don Blankenship, lists the names of all those who died, and, and he gets you just totally riled up. And like it's a rocking song. Just I mean, a lot of these songs feel like if Led Zeppelin did them over again, they'd be classic rock hits, you know. And, and then right after that, if I could see your face, oh, a track sung from the position from the from the mouth of a widow, someone who lost someone that was just talked about. He just listed all the twenty nine names, and he's yelling and he's screaming, and I'm not, I'm angry, and I got a right to be angry. And then Steve Earle just go whoop. I wish I could see your face again. I should have appreciated you more when you were alive. Hi. Ouch. Brilliant. Beautifully done, poetic, and human. It manages to go extremely abstract, talking about these people being mad and then listing their names like you're looking at a memorial plaque. And then immediately goes for the human story that a woman feels having lost her husband. Just beautiful. Keeps going. Very sad with a track called Black Lung. Um, I, I always think of Zoolander whenever I hear Black Lung. But anyways, that's another thing. Really sad, but again, a beautiful thing about the human cost. So Steve Earle is not going to rest until you have thought about everything bad that happens to minors, which is good. We need to be thinking about this. He can't even play with his grandkids because of the black lung. And what's interesting about the song, and I think the strength of the song comes from the fact that in the chorus he talks about a shotgun sitting there. He contemplates suicide, but doesn't do it. And again, the musical style, like you heard there, like just, it just builds and builds. And almost every song you find yourself, like almost, almost like, you know, rock or metal or hip hop or something, you're just like really into it. Like you're really going. Fastest Man Alive is the second to last track, and I don't understand a single word he says on, I swear to God, I listened to the song four times. He gets sort of like a semi-Bruce Springsteen's like vibe to the song, and a little bit like a John Lee Hooker rhythm, and like Bruce Springsteen. I think it's about like some guy who goes to the army and fights Nazis, but it's like, <laughs> I just couldn't, I'm sorry. Like, please tell me what the song Fastest Man Alive is about, because I don't know. But that leads us up to the highlight of the album, Devil put, Devil put the Coal in the Ground, listen to that for the sort of more upbeat, rousing track, and then listen to The Mine, which is the final track. Uh, this is sort of the most modern song uh, in the terms of the fact that it's about mining right now. But it's not about mining. It's about the civilization where mining exists. It's about America right now. It is about the desperation of the working poor. It's about a guy who sells his wedding ring so that he has enough money for his family. And it's all about his excitement that his brother who works at the mine can pull some strings to get him a job. The whole album we've been listening to what a terrible, terrible place this is. How you die of black lung or you die of a lack of oversight. How you just work yourself to death. And all this song is about is the hope that he can get there. The hope that maybe if he's lucky enough my brother will get me on at the mine. And he even mentions the ability to get a new truck. Basically, he is praying that he can break some rocks, that he can buy a truck, that he can listen to Florida Georgia Line. This is what he aspires to. And nothing is more heartbreaking than that. It's just beautiful. I mentioned Bruce. I think Bruce Springsteen is the only example of somebody who managed to be mired in social realism and pop at the same time. I don't think there's any other examples in civilization. I don't think. Uh, uh, you know, maybe Parasite. <laughs> That was pretty popular, and that was some social realism there. I think that was the closest. So Bruce Springsteen and Parasite. I would say the only examples of being able to represent blue-collar difficulties, to represent the desperation of the working poor with an amazing masterpiece of social realism born in the USA, 
co-opted by the people who created the situations it's criticizing, uh, is the only person who's been able to do it. But hopefully, hopefully this album will do it. You know, I, I get the sense that what Steve Earle wants is to reach these people, reach these people who feel that they are being helped by the people who are hurting them. I don't know. As a final note, I have to admit something. I, I really like the uh, I really like the Steve Earle album. It's great. I'm probably gonna buy it, but um, you can, you can't tell anybody this. I actually liked the Florida Georgia Line EP. I recognize all of its flaws, all of its stupidity, all of its pop culture consumer BS, but it's so catchy. And there's a lot of really funny wordplay. And even the songs that are just the most jingoistically torturous, there's something to them. I like it. I can't, I can't help it, so I'm sorry. I apologize to myself five years ago, who would have been very mad that I said I like that kind of music. But it's good. They're both good. And like I said, that's my conclusion. If you want to understand where we are right now, listen to both. Okay, well then, for Gustave Courbet, and for the, for the, di the diners at Ornon, and for my dogs who managed to not bark even once during this whole good boys, this entire video, uh, and for my brother, thank you for uh, having me watch, uh, listen to this music. Uh, there's the camera.